Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for this member's lecture in the brand new, well, newly renovated uh, Breasted Hall. One of the things that's not, yay. <laughs> One of the things we're still waiting on are the lights. Uh, these are not going to be the permanent lights. So tonight we will be unable to turn the lights off during the lecture. So you'll, you'll be in a lecture and uh, in nice illumination, which shouldn't really affect the slides. So, so just, just don't wait for it to get dark. Uh, so thank you for coming. And uh, if anyone uh, is not a member of the Oriental Institute, please stop by, grab me afterwards at the reception. We have a, a whole host of programming next year. There's going to be over 37 special events, uh, huge celebrations. So it's not something you're going to want to miss. So please do grab me, and um, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. And now I'd like to introduce Sue Geshwander, the volunteer manager. Hello. I am recruiting volunteers for the OI docent program. An OI docent is someone who likes an intellectual challenge while doing good works. And our training starts the first week in June. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Since you're here, I know that you guys like learning and the ancient Near East, so I think you should consider becoming a docent. Um, over the course of eight weeks this summer, you will be immersed in the ancient Near East, taught by the OI world-renowned professors and scholars. You'll also have behind-the-scene access to places like the conservation lab, basement object storage, even the director's office, places that are not open to the public or really even accessible to members. Um, applications are due May 1st. Uh, docent training is held every other year, so act now or you'll have to wait until 2021. Um, being an OI docent has been one of the most enriching and rewarding things I've ever done, and I really think you will have the same experience. So I will be at the reception. I would love to talk to you more about the program or answer any questions, so please come find me. Or you can talk to any of the other volunteers that are here. I see many in the audience if you guys want to stand up. Yeah, anybody, ask anybody any questions. Um, but it's a wonderful program, and I hope you take advantage of this opportunity. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Woods, the John A. Wilson Professor and Director of the Oriental Institute. Thanks, Sue, and good evening, everyone, and welcome, as Matt said, to this, our first lecture in this newly renovated hall. This work was actually just finished on Friday, so I hope you all uh, approve of it and uh, find it a much more uh, comfortable experience being here now. Uh, but as Matt said, this, the work isn't fully complete at this point. The uh, ceiling lights here are temporary while our um, beautiful Cypriot-themed uh, historic chandeliers are being restored and rewired. Uh, they'll be put in in May and really be the piece de resistance of this uh, project and complete this renovation of Breasted Hall. So uh, please stay tuned for that. I can think of uh, no better scholar to inaugurate this renovated hall than tonight's speaker, my colleague, Professor Morag Kessel. Morag is associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at DePaul University an affiliate of the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law, and is the director of the Museum of Study, the Museum Studies Minor at DePaul University. Morag has been an associate of the OI since 2008 and has really played an important role in the intellectual life of the OI, including serving on the OI's acquisitions committee. And she has recently served between 2015 and 17 as a Neubauer Collegium visiting fellow here at the university. Morag holds a PhD in archeology span from the University of Cambridge, where she wrote her dissertation on a topic related to tonight's talk, License to Sell, the Legal Trade of Antiquities in Israel. Morag also holds a master's of historic preservation from the University of Georgia, 
as well as an MA from the University of Toronto in Near Eastern Studies and a BA in Classical Studies from Queen's University, Canada. Her areas of specialization are Eastern Mediterranean and Levantine prehistory, as well as cultural heritage protection and policy, specifically concerning trade in antiquities, museum practice, and archaeological ethics. Morag's work combines archaeological, archival, and oral history research in order to understand the efficacy of cultural heritage law in protecting archaeological landscapes from looting. Currently, she is co-director, along with our own York Rowan, of the Galilee Prehistory Project, which traces the dramatic changes that took place in the Galilee between the fifth and early fourth millennia, which involved rapid agricultural expansion, increasing evidence for ritual practice, and intensive craft production. The Galilee Prehistory Project has to date included as part of its initial phase six seasons of excavation and survey at Marj Rabbah, one of the largest known villages in Galilee. Morag is also the co-director of the Follow the Pots project, which traces the movement of early Bronze Age pots from the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan. Morag has published really scores of articles spanning a really, a really impressive range concerned with everything from Neolithic structures to calcolithic ritual and animal management to archaeological methods of aerial photography and ground penetrating radar to museum curation, as well as a broad range of publications on ethical and cultural heritage issues. Morag has three books to her credit, 2013's US Cultural Diplomacy and Archaeology, Soft Power, Hard Heritage, with Christina Luke, and the edited volumes, Archaeologies of Text, Archaeology, Technology, and Ethics with Matthew Rutz, and Archaeology, Cultural Heritage, and Trade in Antiquities. Morag has won grants for her research from the American Schools of Oriental Research, the Wenner Gren Foundation, the W.F. Albright Institute for Archaeological Research in Jerusalem, among many others. Tonight, Morag, a world authority on cultural heritage issues, will be speaking on the new insights her research has revealed into the trade of antiquities in the Holy Land. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Morag Kersel back to this stage. Uh, thanks for that. How can I follow that? That's an amazing talk. But I have props. Um, I've heard a lot of really interesting talks in this space, and I'm delighted to be speaking here this evening in the newly renovated Breasted Hall. I want to thank Professor Woods and the OI for the invitation to share some of my research today. Last fall, I spent a week at Fort Apache in Arizona on a collaborative workshop on best practices in documenting looting at archaeological sites. In many conversations I had with tribal members, I asked how I, a white woman, could do better in my archaeological practice, which is inherently colonial, an, an, an inherently colonial endeavor. They said that public acknowledgement is a place to start. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional and unceded territory of many First Nations people. They are the original inhabitants of this land. I've tried to credit all of the images I use in this presentation, and hopefully there are no copyright violations. I want to provide a warning about the images of our ancient ancestors. I have great reverence for people from the past, and I never show human remains without careful consideration. But working at a looted cemetery makes it very difficult to show images without dead people in them. All of the ethnographic interviews are conducted with protocol review from various ethical review boards, and you anthropologists out there know how onerous that task is. Since 2002, I've been looking at the lives, I'm just going to set this up here, and there we go 
at the lives of early Bronze Age, and that's from about 3600 to 2000 BCE, pots from the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan. I've been trying to figure out how a pot from the city of Sin moves both illegally and legally from the mound, and now I'm going to use my prop. I am passing around one of these mounds. This is the early Bronze Age site of Fefa, which is a cemetery site. I want you to feel all of the little holes that are all looters' holes. This is, sorry, I should just say, this is, I should say. All right, before I pass it around, it's delicate. It is made of uh, high resolution uh, plastic, but it is, so it's a 3D model, and it'll become clear how we put it together in a minute. Can I really give it to me? Yeah, I'm gonna give it to you now. Yes, pass it around, there you go. But no one can take it home because this topic is about stealing and we don't want any stealing going on tonight, right? All right, so I'm interested in how pots go from the mound to the market with both individual and institutional consumers, to the mantelpiece, or the museum vitrine or collection. Artifacts move legally out of sites, into research facilities, into public collections, and often eventually displayed in museum exhibits. In 1978, the OI legally purchased a tomb group from a Jordanian ASOR sponsored license sale. And I'd like to thank Josh Tesuliak, who helped me put together a fantastic exhibit, if I do say so myself, a couple of years ago here. But they also move illegally, passing through many hands across local and national and international borders, and along the way are often laundered, their stolen origins erased. While the ideal path of a pot might have been to remain as a grave good, buried with an ancient ancestor, an examination of the ceramic vessels from sites along the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan has resulted in the recognition that these vessels have extensive itineraries. They have moved a lot. In order to map this movement and to think about flow, I've put together this three-part commodity chain pyramid to think about how artifacts move from the mound to the mantelpiece and how laws might affect them along the way. The pathways of pots are sometimes very complicated, involving complex systems of exchange that are interconnected to the movement of illegal arms, drugs, and human trafficking. The one thing to take away from this pyramid is that the people at the bottom rarely come into contact with the people at the top. The other thing to take away is in the middle section under distribution, the pots move from legal uh, from illegal to legal. The laundering of artifacts occurs in that sphere. So along the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan, there are a series of these early Bronze Age sites, and again, the Bronze Age is from about 3600 to about 2000 BCE, that are thought to be by some the cities of the plain that are mentioned in Genesis in the Bible. Formal excavations at the site, like Baba Dra, have, ident have indicated that these sites can be both mortuary, so for burying your dead, and domestic, where people were living, or just mortuary, as in the site of Fefa. To, to date, we have no evidence for people living in the area of Fefa, but we have evidence of people burying thousands of their dead there. From the systematic excavations undertaken at Fefa by Walt Rast and Tom Schaub, and then again by Jordanian Department of Antiquities representative Mohammed Najjar in 2000, we know that people from this period are buried with a very standardized toolkit. It includes between six and 30 pots, uh, buried per person, a basalt bull, maybe a lamb shell bracelet, which only can come from uh, the Nile, a carnelian bead, which indicates long distance trade with perhaps Afghanistan, limestone mace heads, a flint implement or two, and maybe a copper ring. But this is the standard toolkit that everybody is buried with. Because these sites have been associated with the Bible, Baba Dra has been identified by some as biblical Sodom. And there are grave goods there for the taking. So Baba Dra has been the target of systematic looting for decades. Everyone wants a pot from the city of sin, as one informant told me. 
while not the same Sodom, because there are more than one, there's more than one Sodom out there, of course, headlines and media frenzy like this, which was in the aftermath of an ASOR uh, lecture in November, where the excavators at Tel El Hammam indicated that they had found evidence of a fire, which indicated they were actually biblical Sodom. Um, the interest and demand for artifacts leads to increased looting. The best efforts of the local police, the Department of Antiquities, are often thwarted by long-standing, well-organized networks, which enables these antiquities to flow. As part of a comprehensive project to follow pots from the ground to the consumer, which includes ethnographies, archival research, pedestrian and aerial survey, in June of 2013, we, and I work with Austin Chad Hill of Dartmouth College, launched yeah, you get it? Because we're going to talk about drones, right? Launched a project aimed at archaeological site monitoring. Using unpiloted aerial vehicles, we're employing an unusual research plan of monitoring the site and change over time at FAFA. This early Bronze Age site is mined for its artifacts, and the flyovers provide us with the potential to watch change over time and to assess the effectiveness of Jordanian Department of Antiquities protection strategies, guards, and local community outreach and monitoring. And we also are interested in our own impact on the land and how we might encourage people to come to the site. In addition to using drones, oh, sorry, so using drones, we have recorded over 3,700 holes over three seasons. So there are 3,700 uh, 3, holes here, and over the three seasons that we looked for change over time, we recorded 61 new holes. You might look, who has the model out there? You might look at that and wonder if there's anything left to loot at that site, and that seems like a fair question. But I am here to tell you there are uh, still graves left untouched, and looting continues to this day at this site. So in addition to using drones, we carry out pedestrian survey. One morning in June in 2014, while Chad and I were laying targets at FAFA for our drone flyover so we can make our fancy 3D models, and by we, I mean Chad. I am the person who does the archaeology uh, ethnographies and the survey, but I don't do any of the uh, fancy drone stuff. Sometimes I get to hold it, though. Um, Chad noticed something off in the distance, and he said, Surely, that can't be what I think it is. It's broad daylight. But we went over to investigate, and we encountered two looters <laughs> armed with the standard tools. And this is where I come in, because I am there to do the ethnographies, and I speak to everyone who has a vested interest in the trade and antiquities, and these guys have an uh, interest. Our Department of Antiquities representative from uh, the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, Jihad Darwish, had had car trouble and was not at the site yet. So he was on his way to the site. So we encountered these looters with the standard toolkit, and everyone the world over, and I imagine the archaeologists out there who've encountered looters have seen these same tools. Everybody has a long metal prod, a pokey tool, a shovel, a pick, a flashlight, and a bucket. We know from earlier publications by Paul Lapp, who was the first excavator in this region, that looters look for these non-local black stones which were probably brought to the area to mark a grave. The looters that we spoke to confirmed this. And then with their metal prod, they poke holes in the site surface until they hit the top of a cap, the capstone of a burial chamber. They then take up a shovel and a pick and the looters dig down into the cyst grave. On that morning, they recovered three intact pots. There were many more in the burial, but they were broken. The removal of these pots without an excavation permit from the Jordanian Department of Antiquities is illegal under the current Jordanian law. So they were caught in the act by Jihad, who then had, by this time had shown up, who was the regional antiquities inspector. He called the local police and the pots were confiscated. They were later, later deposited in the local museum with the museum director, Mohammed Zahran. And the looters spent the night in jail and received no fine for their actions. 
I can confirm that they were back the next day. Before their arrest, I took the opportunity to ask a few questions about what happened to the pots they found. A few times a month, they told me big black cars from Amman or Karak come to the site to buy pots. Ethnographic data indica indicates that the looters make anywhere between four to seven dollars per pot, right? So that's what they get for the pot. Over the course of three seasons, as I mentioned, we identified 61 newly looted graves. And based on previous scientific investigation, we know that each grave might have contained between six and 30 vessels. From that, we can estimate the following about the 61 looted graves. The total number of saleable vessels, vessels could be as low as 366 or as high as 1,830. In today's market, these pots sell for between 30 and $150, resulting in a low estimate of around $11,000 and a high estimate of almost $275,000 that can be made from those 61 holes. These are not the multi-million dollar statistics that we might see in the headlines related to Daesh and looting in, Afghan or in Afghanistan or Iraq, but still a significant amount of money that encourages people to loot at this site. The couriers in the black cars take the pots to formerly licensed dealers in uh, Karak and Amman, and where the pots might end up in private Jordanian collections or they change hands again on their way to the market in other parts of the world. So while Jordan banned the trade in antiquities in 1976, it's still legal for Jordanians to own cultural heritage that were in their family collections. 15 years of ethnographic interviews have also revealed that licensed dealers from Israel and Palestine routinely travel to Amman to pick up material to take back for sale in the legal market in Israel. Traveling in the same well-established uh, well networks as arms, drugs, and humans, illegally excavated materials are transferred to the legal market in Israel by backpack, in shipping containers, in diplomatic vehicles and pouches, UN aid trucks, or by plane. When I started this work, somebody said, oh, diplomats are carrying these across the border. So in my head, I thought, diplomats with the backpack or with that, you know, attache case. Actually, diplomats are carrying things across borders in shipping containers, because that can be a diplomatic pouch. So you can move a lot of material in a shipping container. In one account, a dealer met with a Jordanian intermediary and purchased a large early Bronze Age vessel. In order to take it across the international border between Jordan and Israel, and he was going across the Allenby Bridge or the King Hussein Bridge, whatever you like to call it, he filled the vessel with fruit and wrapped it as though it was a fruit basket and hand carried it across the border. Other dealers and intermediaries recount the ease of putting things in their backpacks or their bags, which are rarely checked at any of the border points. But we all know, or perhaps we don't, but global statistics on border inspections indicate that only about 10% of all material anywhere in the world is stopped and checked, allowing material uh, illegal material to move. So once in Israel, couriers, intermediaries, or unsuspecting truck drivers, because sometimes shipments go in the back of aid trucks and people driving the trucks have no idea, move, so these folks move the illegal material to licensed dealers in Israel who launders the pots using the existing legal regime for regulating the trade in antiquities. Under a 1978 law in Israel, it's legal to buy and sell and export artifacts in Is uh, Israeli Antiquities Authority authorized shops. So tomorrow, any one of us could buy a pot in the old city of Jerusalem and bring it home legally. In order to comply with the 1978 law, licensing requirements, uh, the dealer, which are about 50% Israeli, 50% Palestinian, are required to submit an inventory of every item in their holding. <clears throat> and these should be comprised of pre-1978 collections, 
Museum deaccessioning, so when a museum ha thinks they have too many Middle Bronze Age pots, can you ever have too many Middle Bronze Age pots? I'll ask Jean Evans later. Um, so museums can deaccession, and if you, by happen chance, are the nephew of Moshe Dayan, who had one of the largest collections of Near Eastern material in the world, and you inherited it, but you don't want it, you can sell it to the licensed dealers in Israel. Until recently, the registry was typically a handwritten ledger or an Excel spreadsheet, and I have seen handwritten ledgers from the mandate period in certain shops, so from the 1930s that people are still using. The spreadsheets or the description or the entries have vague descriptions like buff colored pot. Sometimes there's a purposefully blurry image that was hastily taken that also accompanies the spreadsheet. And in order to sell the item from the official shop registry, the dealer has to make a request for the export license to be issued by the IAA. The dealer provides the number for the item, the IAA checks the registry and crosses off that item and issues the export permit. The dealer provides the buyer with the artifact and the associated export license and the object can leave the shop and perhaps the country to be imported to destinations unknown, all legally. But due to a very poorly worded aspect of the 1978 law, the onus is on the buyer to ask for the export license. The dealer does not have to offer you one. Buyers visiting licensed shops are mainly concerned with questions of authenticity. They want to know if what they're buying is real. Is it from the Dead Sea Plain? Did someone from the Bible own it or hold it? Buyers assume, and rightly so, that because they're making a purchase in a state licensed shop, that they're required to do nothing further, right? Why would they think otherwise? Unclear in this process is the need for an export license to take the artifact outside of the country. If the tourist doesn't ask for the export license, the dealer doesn't have to offer one, and the artifact leaves the shop, and there's no record of that sale. Which means, and I will say that in my many years of investigating these legal lives of the Levantine artifacts, I've only come across one licensed shop that actually advertises that buyers need to ask for an export license. And there's only one guidebook to the region by Kay Prague, the Blue Guide, that mentions if you're going to buy antiquities, make sure you get an export license. So if there's no request for the export license and no record of the sale, the original registry number can be reused for a similar buff-colored pot. And this is how newly looted material is entering this legal market. Most dealers have storerooms for their extra stock. And this is an image uh, from the December 2018 issue of National Geographic, which was highlighting Bible hunters. This is the basement of Haider Baidun, his shop, which is one of the largest shops in the old city in Jerusalem. There are a lot of antiquities in his basement that can be resold with a new, license, uh, with a new registry number. So in order to tighten this loophole, the IAA recently instituted additional licensing guidelines, which require every licensed dealer to document their entire inventories in their online database. So now the database is held with the Israel Antiquities Authority, not with the individual sellers. Every dealer has to allocate each single artifact with an identification number, an associated picture, and these are all stored, stored in this central electronic database. Requiring an image to be attached to individual registry numbers should make it more difficult to launder newly excavated pieces. But this is, process has only been in place for two years, so the jury's still out on whether it's working. So once these illegal items are now legally available for purchase, who's buying them? In 1869, boredom might have been the impetus for Twain's Innocence Abroad. And if you've read The Innocence Abroad, he has a great passage about how bored tourists to Samaria in this area 
All they could do was look at a dilapidated, dilapidated church and buy antiquities. So that's what his board, um, um, sorry, his board, Innocence Abroad, did. But 15 years of ethnographic work have indicated that people buy artifacts for a whole host of reasons, including the desire to own a pot from the city of Sin. So throughout the many interviews, I've been able to group together sets of consumers, creating a, cat, a series of categories based on shared characteristics. I spend a lot of my days when we're in Jerusalem speaking to people in the old city about what they're buying, why they're buying, and if they'll tell me how much they pay for things. But because there are different types of people, there are also different types of antiquity shops because we all want a different type of uh, experience, a consumer experience. So the first group are the explorers, and these are demonstrably different than any other kinds of tourists. They like to live among the local population, they like to visit sites off the beaten path. In the Holy Land, they're often backpackers or excavation volunteers, although I will say that if you are an excavation volunteer and you're buying antiquities, we running field schools are doing something incorrectly, I think. Um, they usually travel in singly or in pairs. They adapt easily to the food, the customs, and living conditions. They want an authentic touristic experience. And if they purchase an antiquity at all, they visit the Cabinet of Curiosity shop. And this is like your grandparents' attic. There's no order in the store. The artifacts are in dirty boxes. The dealer is dressed like a Bedouin. So you're getting the full package, right? Uh, the whole thing feels way more authentic than anywhere else. I once interviewed a return buyer to a shop. She purchased an item. She brought it home. It was kind of dirty, so she decided to wash it. And it immediately fell apart into three pieces. Three ancient pieces, but they had been glued together. And that is illegal under the law. That's what's known as a composite, and that's illegal. So she was telling me this and I said to her, I can give you the name of the person to contact at the Israel Antiquities Authority if you want to report the dealer. And she looked at me and she said, report him? Why would I do that? I'm gonna go back and buy more from him. I love him. So these are the kinds of conversations I have every day, right? I love that guy. In another encounter with an explorer in an antiquity shop, the tourist wanted something from the year zero. The dealer responded, you, do you mean from the time of Jesus? And the collector said, yeah, the time of Jesus. I have $500 and I want something from the time of Jesus to take back to Australia as a present for some friends. I was just in Syria and Lebanon where I saw a lot of interesting archeological artifacts for sale at much cheaper prices. And remember, I began this research in 2002. So I interviewed a lot of people in the early days and that was before the unrest in Syria. I didn't buy anything there, even though it was a lot cheaper, because I knew that if I went to Israel, I could get a certificate of authenticity, right? You, I would know they were real. So for purposes of clarification, the tourist is not asking about the export license. They're very concerned with the uh, certificate of authenticity. He wants to know that the items are genuine and that they may be from the year zero. So the transaction ensued. The tourist left with a small bronze Byzantine cross, a figurine head from the Persian period, and a Roman coin, all for $500. With each artifact, he received a certificate of authenticity, which the dealer can make on his photocopier in the back room, because it's a buyer beware situation. And he also left with an export license for every object. Now, whether the dealer would have offered the export licenses had I not been sitting there, I don't know. But on that day, the dealer walked away satisfied that his purchases were authentic and he could legally take them out of the country. Elite tourists are fewer in number, and they usually stay in expensive hotels and spas throughout Israel. This type of tourist is less in interested in the experience, so they don't really care if the person's dressed as a Bedouin, but they're interested in the artifacts themselves as objets d'art. They visit shops based on the recommendations of the concierge, of relatives, and of other collectors. 
They want archaeological objects with a connection to an ancient past, but they rarely ask questions about archaeological find spot. This way, they avoid any nasty association with looters or where the thing came from. They don't need to know any of that. They assume that all of the pieces in the licensed shops are le legitimately available for sale. And who wouldn't? These tourists want authentic artifacts that express craftsmanship, art, and aesthetics, originality, cultural and historical roots, and often Judaica. They pay top dollar for authenticity. They shop in the art gallery shop, where the artifacts are on beds of velvet, and they look, you know, they're decontextualized. They have no accompanying information. They also shop in the dealer in two of, in 4% of licensed dealers, there are two dealers who are, operate their business out of their home. So these consumers wish to remain anonymous, and the dealers all have a very small number of re reliable repeat customers. Elite consumers are both institutional and individual, and sometimes both in this example of elite consumerism that I'm going to tell you about now. And you knew this was coming, right? Because we cannot have a conversation about buying and selling antiquities without mentioning the Hobby Lobby. So between 2009 and 2014, Hobby Lobby president Steve Green and his company, the Hobby Lobby, collected Holy Land artifacts. They were particularly interested in textual materials like Dead Sea Scroll fragments, Bibles, and other ancient papyri related to the Bible. So in their book, Bible Nation, the United States of Hobby Lobby, Candida Moss and Bull, uh, Joel Baden suggest that the Greens changed the market for Holy Land antiquities with their acquisition of thousands of artifacts. They acquired over 40,000 artifacts in five years. At the time, I was still conducting my research and I realized that the market was changing, but I had no idea at the time why it was changing. At the same time as amassing their collection, they funded the construction of the Museum of the Bible, which opened in November of 2017 in Washington, D.C., just off the mall. Some of the artifacts they collected are on display and available for study at the Museum of the Bible. Its mission is to bring the Bible to life. I digress here, and I highly recommend the Moss and Baden book and I know that many of the docents here can attest we had a very lively book club. Uh, Brian Muse and I uh, put together this amazing book club where we talked about the Bible nation, and it was a really robust conversation, which I enjoyed very much, um, found very interesting. So in 2010, Green and his antiquities advisor, Scott Carroll, went to the United Arab Emirates and met two Israeli dealers and a third local dealer to examine 1,500 cuneiform tablets, 500 cuneiform bricks, 3,000 clay bulai, may or may not have all been from Iraq. The objects allegedly belong to the family of a third Israeli dealer who was not present in the UAE. So immediately there were some red flags that I am going to enumerate for you. In this and subsequent meetings between Hobby Lobby and the dealers. Dealers licensed in Israel offered artifacts from Iraq for sale in the United Arab Emirates. Okay. Some of the material for sale was the property of a fourth dealer who was licensed by Israel, claiming to be part of his family collection, but they were never, he was never seen as part of face-to-face -face transactions. Antiquities, once the antiquities were purchased, they were shipped to five different Hobby Lobby store addresses. On the customs declaration form, cuneiform tablets were mislabeled as ceramic tiles or samples. And there was a huge discount from the original asking price for these materials. Originally, the dealer wanted 11.8 million, but eventually Green and Scott Carroll agreed to 1.6 million. That's a huge discount. That should have been the biggest red flag. Green never met dealer number four, but he wired payments to seven different bank accounts. Okay. 
In January of 2011, U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized five packages falsely labeled as originating in Turkey. The items arrived at three different Hobby Lobby addresses, labeled only as ceramic tiles or clay tile samples. Following its investigation, CBP seized roughly 3,450 objects. And in July of 2017, after six and a half years of investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn filed a civil forfeiture complaint as part of a settlement agreement with the Arts and Crafts Company. The amazingly named the United States of America versus approximately 450 ancient cuneiform tablets and approximately 3,000 ancient clay bulli compelled the Oklahoma-based corporation to forfeit cash proceeds to the sum of $3 million and to also forfeit the artifacts related to the unlawful import. And they also mandated that the company personnel attend workshops in ethical collecting practices. <laughs> that was part of the settlement. So the Hobby Lobby and Green family admitted their guilt, and in response to the forfeiture, Green stated, some regrettable mistakes were made because we didn't understand the rules for properly bringing in antiquities into the country. Were they the naive collectors who did not ask difficult questions about their archaeological find spot, legal exportation, ownership, or were they blinded by their desire to own artifacts? Were they innocent buyers that they claimed to be? No, because in 2009, before they even started buying antiquities, they consulted with a leading legal expert on the acquisition of artifacts, but willfully chose to ignore the advice they received from that expert. The leading cultural heritage law expert in the country met with them and they ignored the advice. Most of us won't even buy a car without checking Carfax or the VIN number or taking a test drive. They bought 40,000 artifacts and manuscripts without doing thorough due diligence. I would argue that they are not innocent buyers in this situation. So the next category of collector typically does not have the large amount of capital, like the Hobby Lobby group, but their motives for owning are also tied to the Bible. Religious tourism provides a steady flow of tourists who visit the Holy Land for specific religious events, festivals, and rites of passage. They'll make a purchase in almost any type of shop, but by virtue of their schedule, they're only exposed to those shops in close proximity to the religious sites they visit predominantly along the Via Della Rosa, the Christian quarters or the Jewish quarter in the old city. In the tourist shop, artifacts are found alongside floating last supper pens, t-shirts, fridge magnets, and vials of sand and water from the Holy Land. These are all things that are mementos of a visit, a souvenir of the trip, and in most cases, the certificate of authenticity and the date of the artifact are of greatest importance. Currently, there are about 40 licensed shops, and as I mentioned, they're both Palestinian and Israeli-owned, and most of them are in, Israeli, are in the old city of Jerusalem. You can see here the distribution pattern of blue stars mimics the route of the Via Della Rosa, the path that Jesus walked on his way to his crucifixion. This capitalizes on the highest tourist traffic to the area and the greatest number of potential buyers. Despite the diversity of individual tastes and budgets, the basis goal of this low-end collector is to buy something that's evocative of their particular religion. Many buyers want a widow's mite. In the story in Mark 12, 41 to 44, or Luke 21, 1 to 4, a widow donates two small coins while wealthy people donate much more. Jesus explains to his disciples that the small sacrifices of the poor mean more to God than the extravagant, but proportionately lesser donations of the rich. So everyone wants a widow's mite. But they, everybody also wants a pot from the city of sin, which ties us back to that looted artifacts, right? 
So these individuals are also really interested in acquiring materials related to stories from the Old Testament, from the age of the patriarchs and matriarchs, from the time of Abraham and Sarah. They want sight, they want material from biblical Sodom. So the last type of tourist identified as a consumer of archaeological material in the Holy Land is the charter tourist who arrives en masse, traveling by bus from one site to the other. They're never without a guide. The common bond of this group is us. <laughs> Academic institutions, alumni tours. We are the chartered tourists. They will shop wherever the bus drops them or where their guide recommends. <laughs> they usually have a handy place in mind where he or she receives a percentage of the total profits of sales. For charter tourists, the destination is of less relevance than the camaraderie of the trip. Dealers repeatedly have told me that if one person on that trip buys an antiquity, everybody else does. <laughs> you only have to get one person to buy. They often frequent museum shops, which are like an art gallery shop, but with a lot more information. The artifacts are displayed in dioramas that depicting how they might have been used in antiquity. You get a chronological timeline when you enter. There are clear labels for the discerning customers, often with the thought to be archeological find spot and date listed accompanying the artifacts. Now I know someone's wondering out there about replicas. Both the religious and charter tourists have similar buying habits and will buy replicas. They want items that usually sell for between $5 and $20. And they meet the low cost, portable, dustable, understandable criteria articulated by anthropologist Nelson Grayburn. Both groups are willing to buy replicas. The authenticity for, is foregone in favor of an attractive knick-knack or something that would look good on my mantle at home. Low-end collectors from this group will purchase replica artifacts knowing that the item isn't genuine, but preferring the lower price. According to shop owners, Jew, tourists feel closer to Jesus by taking home a Roman oil lamp, even if it's not the real thing. But there's no need to travel to the region. You can own a piece of the Holy Land tonight by going on the internet and typing in early Bronze Age and these pots will pop up. From the comfort of your own home in your jammies, you can buy antiquities from the Holy Land with the typical descriptors of the time of the prophets, land of the Bible, Holy Land. So by the time a tourist encounters a vessel in an antiquity shop with this assigned registry number, the pot has changed hands many times. It's crossed an international border. It's changed identities as part of a laundering process. It's now legitimately available for purchase. It's legal, but the negative consequences of demanding pots from the city of sin leads to this, a looted landscape. And even though it's legal, owning the Holy Land is destructive to the archaeological landscape. These are our ancient ancestors whose graves have been desecrated in the quest for saleable artifacts. The illegal, unrecorded excavation of burial sites results in the removal of desirable objects, the destruction of human remains, and the loss of knowledge about burial customs and practices. Valuable information about mortuary traditions has been lost, and our interpretation of the past has, more, has therefore been skewed. And a Jordanian ancestor has been disinterred and now lies on the ground exposed to the elements. As a part of the Follow the Pots project, I, along with Meredith Chesson of Notre Dame and Austin Hill of Dartmouth College, we are tracking pots far and wide. You can follow our work in English and Arabic. At the moment, our site is under construction because I made my students follow pots, because that's what you do. So I just had students follow 13 tune groups, and we are updating their information as we speak. You can also follow us on uh, the Follow the Pots Facebook page, which was recently described as a nerdy Facebook group with a lot of cool content. So I encourage you to follow us there. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. We have an active presence there. Well, I do. Uh, 
I would be nowhere without the many people who have supported this research and agreed to be interviewed. I have spoken to thousands of people over the course of 15 years, and I really rely on the kindness of strangers. People are so generous with their time, and I'd be nowhere without the communities of Faifa, Safi, and Mazra, where I spend a lot of time as well. I would also be nowhere without my funders. Uh, without generous support from our various funders, I would like to do a shout out for the Vintage Radio Control Society because Chad gives a similar lecture. He has been a member of the Vintage Radio Control Society since he was a kid. He and his dad are both members. And they never envisioned that remote controlled planes would be used to monitor looting at an archaeological site in Jordan. And they were um, very kind to donate some funds to us, but as have many of these other individuals. I would be happy to take any comments or questions that you all might have. Thank you.